Hello, everyone. We have now today again pleasure to host uh, Professor Robert Anderson, who is going to present something about development of outflow tract. So Professor Anderson has been presenting all over the world, and we are so lucky that we can store his talks and then look at them again and again. So Professor, please uh, present your talk to us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Mejani. It's a pleasure to be with you again this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So what I'm going to try to do in this session is to discuss with you the normal development of the ventricular outflow tracts. And hopefully this will set the scene for the understanding of the maldevelopment that can produce the various lesions with which you are confronted. So what do we need to know if we are to understand development, maldevelopment? Well, I believe that if we're to do it properly, we need, first of all, to understand the components of the postnatal outflow tracts. Because only if we know how many parts we're trying to describe, can we even begin to understand where they come from. Now, you'll be well aware if you go into the books, there are already various accounts of development and maldevelopment of the outflow tract. But unfortunately, until very recently, most of those accounts were based on speculation. The situation has changed within the last 25 years, because now we know much more about both the anatomic changes that I'm going to be discussing and also the molecular changes that take place during normal development. So this now permits us with much more certainty to distinguish between what I like to think of as myths as opposed to realities. So what I'm going to present to you today is very much based on the experience that I've had much of it since my alleged retirement because throughout that time, I've been working with Tim Mohan, who was, in the, was initially in Mill Hill with the Medical Research Council, came to the Crick, still is working at the Crick, although like myself, Tim has allegedly retired, but he's prepared the most magnificent set of what we call episcopic data sets. And I'm going to share that with you very shortly. But even more recently, I've been fortunate to work with Professor Wout Lamas, who is now working in the University of Maastricht, and a young lady who's done the most amazing work in reconstructing human hearts. She's called Jill Hickspurs, and I'll be sharing their work with you. Also today, we're still working on this work to have it ready for, present, for uh, publication. And I can now supplement that work with access to the data sets that are available through the Human Biology Developmental Re Resource. Part of that is kept at Great Ormond Street and parts are contributed to this resource from Great Ormond Street, but it's based in Newcastle. And I still have a, an association with Newcastle University and I'm working with Deborah Henderson and Bill Chowdhury to create, to take the most advantage from this human developmental biology resource. So before I start showing you the data, I'd lost, just like to settle with you a couple of things as to how I'm going to be describing the images that you're going to see. When we talk about the mouse heart, we talk about days of development. They are embryonic days, so you will see these numbers appearing on the images. And E8.5 is halfway through the ninth day of development. And the key stages of development in the mouse go from the ninth day of development to the 15th day of development. And that last stage we call E14.5. I'm going to be comparing images of the human heart. And when we grade the human heart, we do that using what we call Carnegie stages. And this is because this 
information was based on analysis of data sets held in the Carnegie Institute. And they go from Carnegie stage 10 to Carnegie stage 23. And in terms of timing, that's about four weeks at Carnegie stage 10, that's after conception, until about seven to eight weeks of development. And that is what we call the embryonic period of development. So Carnegie stage 23 in the human is more or less equivalent to embryonic day 14.5 in mouse heart, by which time the embryonic interventricular communication has closed. So those are the stages I'm going to be showing you. But if we come back to the outflow tract, perhaps the most important piece of work that's already been done is that done by Theodore Kramer. And it's a long time ago since Kramer published this work, as you will see from what I'm showing you on the image at the moment. He published this work in 1942. Now that was important for another significant reason, because that is my birth year. So the account of development of the outflow tracts prepared by Kramer is as old as myself. And I've taken from his stellar account one particular sentence, because that's particularly pertinent to what I'm going to show you today. Because as you see, he felt it was necessary to redefine the terms because of the rapidly changing shapes and locations in which the structures themselves are found at different stages of development. And this caveat is equally pertinent today as it was in 1942. But did Kramer get it right when he suggested that we could talk about the outflow tract in terms of truncus? Conus. Now you will all be well aware that all the time we talk about conotruncal malformations, but I don't think that is adequate. And that is because it does not help us account for the definitive arrangement. And I started off by emphasizing that if we are to understand what is happening in development, we first need to understand what it is we are trying to develop. So let me show you the postnatal outflow tract. You will of course recognize that I'm showing you the outflow tract of the morphologically right ventricle. It's the equivalent of what you can take, can obtain in the echo laboratory when you do a subcostal oblique cut. So here you see arising from the morphologically right ventricle, we have the long freestanding infratibulum. And then you can also recognize the pulmonary trunk, and you know that the pulmonary trunk extends to the margins of the pericardial cavity, and at the margins of the pericardial cavity, it branches into the right and left pulmonary arteries. But there is then a key third part of the normal outflow tract, and that is the arterial roots. And the problem with the concept of development put forward by Kramer is that he did not specifically account for the arterial roots. And it's still a mystery as to whether we should analyze the arterial roots as belonging to the conus or belonging to the truncus. And that is why I think there is a much better way of going about things. Because if we now step back on the basis of what I've just shown you, and we ask the question, what are the components of the definitive outflow tracts, then I hope you'll agree that we have the extra pericardial arteries, those outside pericardial cavity. And then within the pericardial cavity, we can divide the outflow tract into the intrapericardial arterial trunks, the arterial roots, and the ventricular outflow tracts. And I now believe, and I hope I can show you, that it's much better to account for development in comparable tripartite fashion, recognizing also the existence of the extra pericardial pathways. So let me show you what we know about development in the human heart 
thanks to these reconstructions that have been prepared by Wout Lamas and Joe Hexpos. So this is showing you the cavity of the developing heart at the earliest stage of development where we can begin to see the heart. So this is Carnegie stage 10, about four weeks of development subsequent to conception. And what Jill and Wout have done have, is that they have reconstructed the cavities, not only of the heart, but of the developing venous and arterial channels. So here at the tail end of the embryo, you see that in purple, they have reconstructed the umbilical veins. In gray, they've shown you the veins that are on the yolk sac, the vitelline veins, and they come together and they form what we can call the venous tributaries. These eventually will become sinus horns, but at this early stage, there is no venous return from the embryo itself. But the venous tributaries come into the developing heart, which is largely composed of the embryonic left ventricle, but already when we trace the developing heart cranially, we see that it expands into an outflow tract. And then the outflow tract goes outside the pericardial cavity and gives rise to the two aortas. If we go one stage forward to Carnegie stage 11, you see that now there has been a remarkable change in what's happening. Because now we have formation of the ventricular loop. And now we can see that coming from the cranial part of the ventricular loop, we have the outflow tract. We go one stage further, and now we can begin to see the development of something that really does look like a heart. So here we are, Carnegie stage 13. We are at five weeks of development. And you'll now appreciate that you can see the developing atrial chambers and you can recognize the atrioventricular canal. More importantly, we can see that the atrioventricular canal is opening exclusively into the inlet part of that ventricular loop. But now from the outer curvature of this ventricular loop, we can see the developing trabeculations of what will become the definitive left ventricle. If we look towards the outlet component of the developing loop, we can see the developing trabeculations of what, we will, what will become the right ventricle. And now very nicely, we see the right ventricle is supporting outflow tract, and we can track the outflow tract all the way to the margins of the pericardial cavity. Now what Jill and Wout are showing you here is a reconstruction of the cavity of the developing heart that is made from a serially sectioned human embryo that's contained within the archive of the Carnegie Institute. But we can also look at what is happening through scanning electron micrographs. And this is a scanning electron micrograph of a heart, the same stage of development, Carnegie stage 13. This was made by a Hungarian embryologist called Szabolcs Virág. Sadly, Szabolcs is no longer with us, but he worked with Wout Lamas when Wout was still at the University of Amsterdam. And this beautiful scanning electron micrograph shows you the outside of the heart. And you can see how similar it is to that reconstruction I showed you just a moment ago, prepared now by Jill and Wout in Maastricht. So what you see is the developing right ventricle and the scanning electron micrograph confirms that at this early stage of development, the outflow tract is exclusively committed to the developing right ventricle. But what I'd like to suggest to you is that when we look at the developing outflow tract, we can now see that it has a proximal part. It has an intermediate part where it bends. And then it has a distal part. And the distal part extends to the margins of the pericardial cavity. So just as in the definitive heart, at this early stage, 
I think it's very easy also to describe the developing outflow tract as having these three parts. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to describe the development of these different parts, remembering what Kramer said, the components of these parts may not always stay where you see them at the moment. And hopefully that statement will become understandable to you as we move forward. But remember, I'm only showing you here what is going on to the margins of the pericardial cavity. Now, Zabok's Virag did this exquisite dissection of that particular data set, and he was able to show what is going on beyond the margins of the pericardial cavity. So he's dissected the human embryo at this stage to show you the cavity of the distal outflow tract. And there are the margins of the pericardial cavity. And what you can see is that the cavity the distal outflow tract beyond the margins of the pericardial cavity enters into another cavity that is within and enclosed by the pharyngeal mesenchyme. And we call that cavity the aortic sac. And what you see is that arising from this aortic sac are the cavities of the arteries that percolate through this pharyngeal mesenchyme and join together dorsally to form the dorsal aortas. And these are what we call the pharyngeal arch arteries. So what I've now shown you is that we can analyze the intrapericardial outflow tract as having proximal, intermediate, distal components, and then beyond the margins of the pericardial cavity, the pathways continue and supply the aortic the pharyngeal arch arteries. So let me now show you how we can look at the development of these extra pericardial components based on the reconstructions made by Jill and Wout of this series of human embryos taking us on beyond Carnegie stage 10. So here I'm showing you the right side of the developing embryo at Carnegie stage 12. And you see that bulging out of the pharynx, we have these pouches. And adjacent to the pouches, we have developing arteries within these pharyngeal arches. So there is the artery, the first pharyngeal arch. There you see the bulge that's made by the second pharyngeal pouch. And between first pouch, second pouch, we have the second arch artery. And as we progress through time, so here is one stage further, Carnegie stage 13, you see there are changes taking place in pharyngeal pouches and the arteries that they were associated with. Because now, adjacent to the first pharyngeal pouch, we have lost the first artery it will eventually become a small artery associated with the ear. We see second pouch now, and between there we still see the second arch artery. And as we go back, we now see that bulging out of the pharynx, we have a third pouch giving us the third arch artery. And then behind that, we see the fourth arch artery. But these changes continue because we take another step forward, Carnegie, Carnegie stage 14. And now we're also showing you the heart contained within its pericardial cavity. But now both the first and the second arch arteries have disappeared. So now the arteries, the arteries arising from the aortic sac are the third arch artery, the fourth arch artery, and another artery has appeared that is dorsal or caudal to the fourth pharyngeal pouch. But I'm now going to call that the artery of the pulmonary arch. Now, why do I call it the pulmonary arch? Because if you go to most of the books, you'll see this described as the sixth arch artery. But, if it's the sixth arch artery, 
we have to ask the question, what has happened to the fifth arch? And you will know that the literature of pediatric cardiology is replete with malformations interpreted on the basis of persistence of a fifth arch artery. But in fact, there never is a fifth arch artery because there is never a fifth pharyngeal arch. And we know that through a very exquisite piece of work done by Anthony Graham and his colleagues published last year in the Journal of Anatomy. As Anthony said, we need to reappraise and revise the numbering of the pharyngeal arches. So I'm now showing you that situation at Carnegie stage 14 again. I'm now showing it to you from behind as I want to emphasize the symmetry of the dorsal aortas. So you're looking there at the back of the aortic sac and now arising from the aortic sac, percolating through the pharyngeal mesenchyme, join the dorsal aorta, you have the bilaterally symmetrical third arch arteries, fourth arch arteries, and what I'm now going to call the pulmonary arches, the arteries of the pulmonary arches, because there is never a fifth arch. I don't want to relabel these arteries as fifth arch arteries, as that would be terribly confusing, but they are not sixth arch arteries. So what I'm going to call them is the arteries of the pulmonary arch. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that the dorsal aortas are bilaterally symmetrical and they give rise to the seventh cervical segmental arteries. And they are important because they will become the subclavian arteries. But look how distant they are at the moment from the arteries arising from the aortic sac. But as we trace things forward, and I'm now only going to show you reconstructions of the arteries themselves, we see the amazing remodeling that is done very swiftly that produces the definitive arrangement. So here I'm showing you the extra pericardial channels from the right side. So again, we see the aortic sac, it has a right horn, it has a left horn, and they are now supplying the bilaterally symmetrical channels that run through the pharyngeal mesenchyme to the dorsal aortas. So again, fourth arch arteries, and we see now that at the back, the dorsal aorta has become the carotid duct. It is joining together the dorsal ends, the third arch arteries, fourth arch arteries. And there are our arteries of the pulmonary arteries. But already the right pulmonary arch arteries is beginning to be involuted relative to its left sided counterpart. And now extending down within the pharyngeal mesenchyme, taking origin from the caudal part of those pulmonary arch arteries, we have the right and left pulmonary arteries we see that the right dorsal aorta is also beginning to diminish in size, but the seventh cervical intersegmental arteries are beginning to become into closer apposition to the arch arteries themselves. I've now turned the reconstruction at CS17 so that you can look at it from the back. And you see again how the right dorsal aorta is diminishing in size, and now you note how the heart itself is migrating caudally relative to the seventh cervical intersegmental arteries. The arteries themselves cannot move because they are within the segment itself. So that is evidence that the heart itself is moving caudally. And as it does so, it brings the seventh cervical intersegmental arteries much closer to the third and fourth arch arteries. Note also that not only is the right dorsal aorta diminishing in size, so is the artery of the right pulmonary arch. But now we see the right horn of the aortic sac feeding the right third arch artery, the right fourth arch artery. And that continues through the diminishing right dorsal aorta to fill the, to, fi to, to supply the right seventh cervical intersegmental artery. On the left side, we 
the left horn of the aortic sac, and it is giving rise to the third and fourth arch arteries, and then through the dorsal aorta itself on the left side, the seventh cervical intersegmental artery, which remember will become the subclavian artery. Note now that the dominant pulmonary arch artery is the left one, and that of course will become the arterial duct. So we go one stage forward, and I'm now showing it to you from the right side. And we see that within the pericardium, we can recognize the intrapericardial aorta and the extra pericardial aorta. I'll show you that in just a moment. But now the right horn of the aortic sac has become the brachiocephalic artery. And it is supplying the right common carotid artery, the right fourth arch artery, and the right seventh cervical intersegmental artery. And note the marked diminution in size now of the attenuating right dorsal aorta. The left horn is supplying the left common carotid artery, continuing as the left fourth arch artery. And there on the other side now, we have the left seventh cervical intersegmental artery, remember, which will become the arterial duct. So the pulmonary trunk is now continuing through the pulmonary arch artery, which will become on the left side, the arterial duct. So then by Carnegie stage 20, about seven weeks of human development, we have the definitive situation. The outflow tracts themselves have now separated. The right outflow tract is continuing as the intrapericardial pulmonary trunk, which gives rise to the right and left pulmonary arteries. The right pulmonary arch artery has disappeared completely. The left pulmonary arch artery is now the arterial duct. But if we now look at what's happening on the morphologically left side, we see the left ventricular outflow tract giving rise to the aortic root, the ascending aorta. And now the rightward horn of the aortic sac has become the brachiocephalic arch artery, whereas the left horn is now the transverse arch of the aorta. And that is giving rise to the left common carotid artery, continuing as the left fourth arch artery, and the intersegmental arteries which become the subclavians have now passed cranial to the arterial duct. And on the left side, now we can recognize that left seventh cervical intersegmental artery as the subclavian artery. And the same thing has happened on the right side with the disappearance of the right dorsal aorta. So very rapidly, we have seen this remodeling going from a bilaterally symmetrical situation to the definitive situation. And it is this remodeling that permits us to understand vascular rings and slings on the basis of the Edwards hypothetical double arch. And we can talk about that in a subsequent presentation. But let's now look at what's going on within the pericardial cavity. And let's do that in tripartite fashion. So let's start with the distal outflow tract. And again, I'm now going to show you a histologic section. We're back to Carnegie stage 13. You remember, I hope, that I showed you first the reconstruction made by Jill and Wout to show you what's happening with the cavities. I then showed you the scanning electron micrograph produced by Zabox Virag. This is now a histologic section, and this is one of the embryos contained in the archive of the Human Developmental Biology Resource. And it is showing you that tripartite arrangement of the outflow tract. There you see the proximal part. At the bend, we have the intermediate component. And then beyond the bend, we have the distal outflow tract extending to the margins of the pericardial cavity. And there you can clearly recognize the pharyngeal mesenchyme. And you've already seen the remodeling, these arch arteries that are percolating through the pharyngeal mesenchyme to reach the dorsal aortas. Now there is a crucial point at this stage because within the lumen 
of the alpha tract, which is a solitary entity at this stage, it is lined by cardiac jelly, but the walls of the outflow tract are made of myocardium and they extend all the way to the margins of the pericardial cavity. Now you are all well aware that in the definitive heart, the intrapericardial components of the outflow tracts are largely arterial. So something has to happen to these myocardial walls. And what we can see from reconstructions we've made by Carnegie stage 15, we see that already this myocardium is beginning to regress from the margins of the pericardial cavity, but it does not do so in uniform fashion. This you're seeing is a reconstruction of a human heart. This is further work we did with colleagues in Amsterdam with Anton Moorman, Alexander Caesarov. But we also did work using mouse hearts. And we've reconstructed mouse hearts to compare the situation that you see in the human arrangement. So this is a reconstruction of the mouse heart. And what you see in green is non-myocardial tissue that is growing into the distal outflow tract and is occupying parts of the wall that previously were myocardial. And this is early on day 11.5 in the mouse heart. And that is what these non-myocardial components look like when we reconstruct them. You see there is a collar cranially and arising from this collar, we have the two tongs. And those tongs insert between margins of the myocardial wall that look like a fish mouth. And those tongs fill those jaws of the fish mouth. Within the myocardial walls, shown here in brown and yellow, you see what has happened to the cardiac jelly, because it has come together to form what we are going to call ridges, other people call cushions. So I showed you a reconstruction of the mouse heart. Jill and Wout have reconstructed human heart at a comparable stage, and we see exactly the same thing. We see that the myocardium, which is colored in this reconstruction in green, has regressed from the margins of the pericardial cavity, so that now we can recognize the beginning of the intrapericardial aorta. And there in their reconstruction, you see this fish mouth regression. And that jaw of the fish mouth is filled by the developing non-myocardial wall of the intrapericardial aorta. If we look at it from the left side, you can see again the very nice fish mouth. The margins of the pericardial cavity are occupied also by non-myocardial tissue, but then filling the leftward side, we have the non-myocardial tissue will form the parietal wall of the pulmonary trunk, inserting itself between this fish mouth and the distal myocardial border. I can then show you what's happening if I cut a long axis section through the middle of the outflow tract. And so now I've reverted to a mouse heart and I'm showing you one of our episcopic data sets. Because within the distal outflow tract, you can see how the cardiac jelly has come together from what we call the septal ridge, the parietal ridge. And you see that they are lying edge to edge and they will separate the intermediate and the proximal parts of the outflow tract into the aortic and pulmonary channels. But the distal outflow tract at this stage, which now has non-myocardial walls, as there you see the myocardium stop short of the extent the pericardial cavity, so the distal part is now non-myocardial, but beyond the margins of the pericardial cavity, you see that there is a protrusion that is growing from the back wall of the aortic sac, and that is growing between the arches of the, the arteries of the fourth arch, which you've seen already, the arteries of what in this image I'm still calling the sixth arch, in fact, we would now like to call that the, the pulmonary arch. As, as I've told you, there is no fifth aortic arch 
But if I rotate the cutting plane, so I show you the orthogonal long axis through the distal outflow tract, and there you see the margins of the pericardial cavity. And now you can recognize the developing cavity of the intrapericardial aorta, the intrapericardial pulmonary trunk. You see that protrusion that is growing forward from the back wall of the aortic sac towards the distal margins of the ridges that have separated the intermediate part of the outflow tract now into the aortic and the pulmonary channels. But what you can very nicely see is that at this stage, be at what we can think of as an intermediate stage, there is still a communication between the intrapericardial aorta, the intrapericardial pulmonary trunk. And this is an embryonic aortopulmonary foramen. And if that does not close, you have an aortopulmonary window. And we can see such an aortopulmonary window just prior to its closure during normal development. So here I've cut the episcopic data set such that you can look into the developing intrapericardial aorta. There is its cavity. You see that the cushions have come together, the ridges have come together. As I'm going to show you in just a moment, they are going to form the aortic valve, but there in the wall of the intrapericardial aorta, facing the pulmonary trunk, we have an embryonic aortopulmonary foramen. If it doesn't close, it will persist as aortopulmonary window. But normally it does close, so I can now tell you that the intrapericardial arterial trunks are formed by the growth of non-myocardial tissues into the area of the distal outflow tract that was initially myocardial. So those non-myocardial walls occupy an area which initially was myocardial. And what I've shown you is the intrapericardial aorta, the intrapericardial pulmonary trunk are separated one from the other by this growth of the protrusion of the dorsal wall of the aortic sac. And so we can call that the aortopulmonary septum. So now what is happening in the intermediate outflow tract? So to show you that, I can go back to another reconstruction we made of a mouse heart. And this is the stage after we've had separation of the intrapericardial arterial trunks. So remember E12.5, the 13th day of development of the mouse heart. Everything you see in silver is myocardial. What you see in green is the intrapericardial arterial trunk. What you see in red are the extrapericardial pathways that are percolating through the pharyngeal mesenchyme. So there in green, I'm showing you the intrapericardial arterial trunks. So you'll see that the persisting intermediate distal components of the outflow tract are still myocardial. So because this was a three-dimensional data set, I was able to separate out the outflow tract. And it's the same outflow tract. I've now turned it so that you can look at it from a back and above. Remember, green is the non-myocardial intrapericardial arterial trunks. Silver is the myocardial walls surrounding the intermediate and proximal parts of the outflow tract. So now I can take away the green non-myocardial intrapericardial arterial trunks and I can show you the distal margin of the intermediate part of the outflow tract. Remember, silver is myocardium. Within the cavity of the outflow tract, however, the septal ridge has come edge to edge with the parietal ridge and separated the intermediate part of the outflow tract into the aortic and pulmonary components. And two more swellings have appeared within the intermediate part of the outflow tract that interdigitate with the parietal margins of the major ridges. And so one is going to be pulmonary, the other one 
is going to be aortic and they are producing the primordiums for formation of the arterial roots. We can see the same thing happening in the human heart and there has been further regression of those walls of the fish mouth. So now you can see that the distal outpo tract itself is occupied by the intrapericardial components of the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. The remaining myocardial walls clothe the intermediate and the proximal parts of the outflow tract. And I can show you the same thing in a longitudinal section through the developing outflow tract, now in an episcopic data set of a developing human heart. So that distally, you see the non-myocardial walls are separated to become the intrapericardial aorta, the intrapericardial pulmonary trunk. This is the component we're now concentrating upon, the component that retains its myocardial walls. So there is the proximal part that retains its myocardial walls, but the ridges within it have yet to fuse. The ridges, however, have fused within the intermediate part of the outflow tract, but that still retains its myocardial walls. There is the area in the middle of the outflow tract that they fused. What I can now do is I can take a short axis section through this intermediate part of the outflow tract. And I'm going to show it to you not in this human data set, but instead in a mouse data set. So now you're looking at this short axis section across the intermediate part of the outflow tract in the mouse to embryonic day. 12.5. You're looking at it from above and from the right side. And you will now recognize dorsally the developing aortic root, cranially the developing pulmonary root, still within their myocardial walls and still within the, my, the collar that surrounds them. But then as things proceed, we can see how those distal components of the cushions within the myocardial wall or the ridges are excavating from the leaflets of the arterial valves. And now I'm back to a human episcopic data set. So behind you see the developing aortic root, to the front and cranially you see the developing pulmonary root. And you can very nicely now see that we are still within the myocardial collar. You see that the ridges are fused centrally to separate the one root from the other, but you can also very nicely see how the ridges themselves are excavating or remodeling to form what will eventually become the leaflets of the arterial valves. And you can also see that is, that is happening both in the aortic and in the pulmonary roots. So if I summarize what I've shown you, about the intermediate part of the outflow tract, you see that the intermediate part will form the arterial roots, but that is done within the turret of persisting myocardium. And only with ongoing development will that myocardium eventually disappear. What I've shown you is that the distal margins of those ridges themselves will remodel process that we call excavation, and that will form the valvar leaflets. The sinuses, however, are formed by ongoing growth of non-myocardial tissues from the heart-forming areas within the pharyngeal mesenchyme, and they continue and they occupy that area that initially was made up of myocardium. So let's finish by looking at what happens to the proximal outflow tracts. And here I'd like to make an analogy to what you are all familiar with in terms of the treatment of infants or children with double outlet right ventricle. Because what I'm going to show you is that as we start to divide the distal outflow tract, the embryo has double outlet right ventricle. Both developing outflow tracts are supported by the developing morphologically right ventricle. 
So when you are confronted with a patient with double outlet right ventricle, usually you will ask the surgeon to correct the lesion. And the surgeon does so by creating a tunnel within a cavity of the right ventricle so as to connect one or other of the arterial roots with the left ventricle. And we now know that that is exactly what the embryo does to separate the proximal outflow tract into its aortic and pulmonary channels. So here I'm showing you a cut now of what is happening at embryonic day 12.5. You've already seen that by this stage, the intermediate part of the outflow tract is separated into the aortic root and the pulmonary root. And I've taken this particular cut to show you the cavity of the developing right ventricle. You see that the atrioventricular canal has now expanded, so that the right ventricle has its own inlet. But I'm also showing you the cross section of the developing aortic root. And I hope you will immediately appreciate that the aortic root is exclusively above the cavity of the right ventricle. At this stage, the embryo still has double outlet right ventricle. So the exit from the left ventricle is now the interventricular communication. In fact, part of the primary interventricular communication is expanded so as to provide the right ventricle with the inlet that is shown by the red arrow. So now we can call this persisting interventricular communication the secondary communication. And you will appreciate it is providing the outflow tract to the left ventricle. I can take the data set and I can show it to you as you would see it on oblique subcostal cut in echocardiography. And so there is that secondary interventricular communication. It is providing the outflow tract for the developing left ventricle. But here are the proximal ends of the ridges that are dividing the proximal outflow tract into its aortic and pulmonary channels. And they have nearly completely fused, but not quite. You can, however, see that the pulmonary root is separate the aortic root, and those proximal ridges are coming together to build the shelf and the roof of the right ventricle that will commit the aortic root to the left ventricle. And at a slightly later stage, now embryonic day 13.5, you can see what has happened as the embryo has built that shelf in the roof of the right ventricle. There is the aortic root. Note that it is still positioned directly above the cavity of the right ventricle. But I've taken my cut such that I can show you that the parietal ridge, the proximal part of the parietal ridge, has now fused with the proximal part of the septal ridge. And the fusion of those two components has built the shelf that is now converting secondary interventricular communication into the outflow tract for the left ventricle. At this stage, however, there is still a persisting small channel between the aortic root and the cavity of the right ventricle. And this is what, in a moment, I'm going to show you, we can call the tertiary interventricular communication. So you're looking at the developing heart from the aspect of the developing right ventricle. I've cut away the parietal wall of the right ventricle. And now you see the developing pulmonary root. And you can see that the shell of the proximal ridges is now muscularizing. And that will become the freestanding subpulmonary infundibulum. There is the aortic root. And by building the shelf in the roof of the right ventricle, the embryo has committed the aortic root through the secondary interventricular communication into the left ventricle. So that small hole that you now see in the roof of the right ventricle is what we can call the tertiary foramen. And that will be closed by growth 
of tissue from the atrioventricular cushions that will form the membranous septum. And you will immediately appreciate that should that hole not close, it will give us a perimembranous ventricular septal defect. But if all goes well, the tissue from the atrioventricular cushions closes that hole, committing the aortic root into the left ventricle through the secondary foramen, becoming the outflow tract for the left ventricle. And that will complete development of the outflow tracts. So let me take you back to the starting point, the tripartite approach to outflow tract development. And what I've suggested as the early stage, we can divide the outflow tract into a proximal part, an intermediate part that is at the bend, a distal part and extends to the margins of the pericardial cavity. Beyond the margins of the pericardial cavity, we have the aortic sac. And now we can put everything together because we know that the aortic sac becomes the extra pericardial arterial pathways. The distal part of the outflow tract, which initially was myocardial, has those myocardial walls replaced and they become the intra pericardial arterial trunks. What I've shown you, the intermediate part of the outflow tract remodels and becomes the arterial roots, initially within again a myocardial turret, but the myocardium continues to regress so that in the definitive heart, the valves are surrounded by the sinuses and the sinuses have lost their myocardial covering. And so the myocardium then persists only in the proximal part of the outflow tract. Myocardium has been added to form the freestanding muscular subpulmonary and fundibulum. Myocardium is taken away from the left ventricular outflow tract so that in the definitive heart, the left ventricular outflow tract on its posterior margin is made up of fibrous continuity between the leaflets of the aortic and mitral valves. So what I hope I've been able to show you in this presentation is that the definitive outflow tract has three parts, the ventricular outflow tract, the arterial roots, the intrapericardial arterial trunks. Beyond the margins of the pericardium, we have the extra pericardial pathways. And now I hope I've persuaded you, you can understand development when you think also of the intra pericardial outflow tract being tripartite, the proximal part becomes the outflow tract of the ventricles, the intermediate part, the aortic roots, the distal part, the intrapericardial arterial trunks, and then the extra pericardial component is made up of those pharyngeal arch arteries remodel to give us the extra pericardial arterial pathways. And hopefully that now gives you the basis for understanding not only the normal heart, but also the malformations can involve the definitive outflow tracts. Thank you.